Hello, and welcome to B2B Revenue Leaders. I'm your host, Dustin Tizik. This podcast is brought to you by Testimonial Hero. So we can all agree social proof is great. It really helps sales and marketing, but reference calls don't scale. And when was the last time you actually read a case study? Testimonial Hero helps create strategic video testimonials to help you close more deals faster. Learn more at testimonialhero.com. Today, I'm joined by Edin Badani, who is the head of strategy and copy at Cape Agency. So I actually recently partnered with Edin to rework our positioning and create copy for a new website, which should go live right about now, depending on when this episode gets published. And in this episode, she explains why conversion rate and revenue problems are usually just a sign of poor messaging, why brand archetypes matter, common mistakes copywriters make, and how you can't hack your way to successful positioning. On to the episode. Hey, Edin, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me today, Dustin. Yeah, th- this will be a fun one. I think, you know, we recently worked together. By the time this episode comes out, our new website might be live, which you played a massive part in and working on the messaging, strategic narrative and all that. But before we dive into that, when we were talking before this, one thing you mentioned was, you know, conversion and revenue problems are actually usually messaging problems in disguise. Let, let's dive into that a bit, because I think people hear conversion rate optimization and they think change a button, move a form. But that's not really what it is. So yeah, let's hear what you have to say there. Yeah, absolutely. I think people I think people are slowly starting to become aware that it's like conversion rate optimization, growth hacking, performance marketing. It's not there are things that you can do when you have a good product and you have, you know, your product market fit, you have a good audience, you can scale that. Mm-hmm. But it's not it's not there's no way to kind of hack to a long term revenue. I think it's the, I find it's not, as you mentioned, it's not as simple as like changing a button or, you know, and removing a, f- a field for adding, adding a field, you know, and adding a field on a form or removing a field off. It's much, much, much deeper than that. And this is the problem that I saw when I used to work, uh, when I was working with companies and why I started to actually offer messaging myself as something because I just saw that they needed it. They, you know, there's, there was so much that you, there's so much that you could do to optimize things. But then you kind of get to a point where you hit a wall. So where revenue might be dropping off or conversion rates might be dropping off. It's like, well, we've kind of done almost everything that we think that we can do. But then you get, but then you look at why that might be happening. You find out that sometimes the company is not even saying the right things in the first place. So the, what they thought was a value proposition doesn't actually resonate with the target audience or what, how they're positioning themselves is not in line with what the audience really deeply desires. You go, well, that's, you have to fix that first before we can actually start fixing you can look at even improving you know improving conversions and improving revenue so the the deeper you go down the rabbit hole you know the more we kept uncovering that it was really some things if the company is not really clear on their positioning what their value propositions are what's that benefit you know what are those benefits that they're delivering to customers it's going to be so hard to try and just keep hacking your way to success for sure. And I think the sure, yeah. I think where people go that conversion rate route is it's easy to pick a thing, change it, and test it. Whereas positioning and messaging is the complete opposite. It is basically a company strategy and probably the biggest thing you could possibly work on. So let's say they realize that, they know they have a positioning and messaging problem. How do they start diagnosing that and where to start and what changes to potentially make? So I think one of the one of the easiest way I think to to diagnose that is that if you're having really good conversion rates inside a demo, so post or post demo conversion rates yeah. are really good. Like they they people are excited after the call, they're really eager to sign up, they're looking forward to working together, or they once they're free trial. If you've got a free trial offer for a SaaS product, you know PLG method. If you've got a free trial and people are coming through and the conversion rates are good after that, you know, like fantastic. So you know the product is good. You know things are good. When people get inside the product, when they can see it, they touch it, they feel it, or they speak with someone, uh, you know that that's good. So that's working. It's what happens is when you're struggling to get people through into those demos in the first place. It's that real what Nicole top of funnel, but it's all that trust building. It's all that awareness building. It's that trying to connect with people it ought to motivate and inspire them enough to want to actually take that first step on their journey to conversion. So I think it's usually when you see, usually when you see that, so you see conversion rates are really fluctuating or CPA, you know, is, is, is going up and down all the time. You keep pouring money into money into ads and it's nothing seems to be working, even though you keep trying changing up the creative. And that's when we start to see, or or you've been doing again conversion rate optimizations, and things just seem to keep going down. 
no matter how much you try. But once you get people in, they convert. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Right. And you mentioned, you know, writing it in a way that connects with them. You know, they think, oh, I've had that problem or, oh, I've, I feel that thing that you're messaging about. And I also find sometimes companies go too far that way and it sounds great and you have no idea what the hell their product is. And it's this delicate yeah. balance, I think, of what do you actually do? Why should I care? How are you different? And that's hard because it's making this complex thing simple. So, you know, say you sign on with a new client. I mean, you we, we signed on with you, so we went through this. I know the answer. But what is the process you would take to really understand the brand and then work from there to make it, you know, digestible while also making it hit home and have a feeling attached to it? Absolutely. So I think there's kind of there's two things here. And I think that's what that's where a lot of companies often get really stuck with. There's the product positioning and there's the company positioning. The company yeah. positioning is usually largely tied to the CEO and the core team. It's like who they are, what they're doing, what is their mission, what is, you know, that mission, vision, strategic narrative, what is that long, long-term goal that they have? What is their vision for the company and its growth for the future? And that vision is executed by way of their product. The same type of but you have the product positioning, which is related, of course, to the vision, mission, and strategic narrative. But it's also it is also slightly different because it's much closer again to the end customer. Because an end customer, I've been quoted recently as saying, "I don't believe to start with why from the customer's perspective. Exactly. You need to start with the customer's why." So when you get close to the customer, telling them your vision, mission is not going to inspire them to convert. You need to tell them why your you know how your product fits into their world, and that's they go what how they're going to convert. At the same time. That vision, mission, strategic narrative, it wraps, it blends really well with the product positioning. And then it gives it a unique, it gives it that, you know, we say that something, something, that unique flavor, a unique approach. It gives it a layer of emotion that's wrapped up into the product. And it makes really people really sit up and go, oh, wow. So it doesn't seem like this is a dry product. It's all a devoid of life. Like it might, it might drive revenue. It might grow your business. It might win you more customers. You know, that's great. But it's like, but what else is there? Like what, how's that going to make me feel? What am I, I want to know what I'm going to feel like when I'm working with these people or with this company or with this product? How is it going to make my life better? What's that vision? And so you have kind of both, both need to play a role, I think. And that's why, again, that brand, that brand and that company positioning is one thing and the product positioning is another thing. They are closely interrelated, but when you have both of them, then they feed into each other and it really makes things a lot. It, it gives it gives a special layer to everything. And again, I, I come from an anthropology background and so I'm always looking at, there are uh, universal themes. There are uni you know, everyone says everyone connects to stories. It's like, that's great, but there are universal themes within those stories, types of characters, personalities, emotions people understand you know that people understand if you were just going to say the personality of for taking an example the personality of a hero the personality of a leader or the personality of a magician or the personality so you and people immediately understand like these are things that translate well across multiple languages and cultures there is some type of magician they might not call it magician but it's in the same kind of entity in any other society or culture in the world so what kind what can you channel or what does your brand align with from the CEO and the company's perspective and then from the product, the customers or product experience, what kind of aligns with both of those that's going to wrap everything in a really, in a nice, emotional, powerful layer that speaks to more than just the product. Yeah. And it's, it's funny when you explain that too, I can picture brands that have done that well, but I could have never explained why it worked. So for the end user, you know, the, they just get that feeling, they get what the product is, and it resonates without fully understanding all that work that goes in behind it, of course, which is the difficult side of it. And you went there a bit into, you know, brand archetypes and how that ties in in the overarching. And I found that interesting when we went through it, because we were a little torn on that, honestly. So, you know, we are premium, more expensive product, like flat out, that's how it is. That's where we stand in the market. But we also kind of wanted to be we're a young company, like I'm the oldest person here and I'm not 40 yet. Like that's just how the company is. So they wanted to be yeah. also young and hip, right? So balancing those two was difficult, but I found having the archetype to go back to made it a lot easier whenever I had to write copy or pick things up. Absolutely. And as I mentioned, it's like, it's the same when you have a brand voice guide or when you have, you know, any tone of voice guide, any visual identity, everything, anything that the company is going to continue on to do, it just keeps everything aligned with the verbal identity, so what you're writing, and then the visual identity 
but then it also gives you room to grow. So how can you explore that? You can expand on that. It's not restricting. I think the problem with the problem with archetypes is a lot of people really, first of all, a lot of people really look down on them because I think a lot of people approach them in the wrong way. They look at it saying, well, we want to be an X brand. We want to be a hero brand or we want to be a magician brand like Disney. So we have to do what Disney did and we are going to take this top down strategy. But it's absolutely not like that. The brand archetypes come from understanding what your customer's lived experience is when working with the company. So what is that? What kind of emotions, what kind of words, things that they're saying, and then try to find what that aligns with and as well from the company's perspective. So you're kind of triangulating all this data at the same time, but then you're looking at, well, where where, where does everything match up the most? And when you land on it, it it will really help just keep everything aligned. Just as you said, it gives you a direction. You know what you want to be doing and it helps you refine your word choice, helps you, re- you know, refine the visual identity as well as you're going along. So really, and again, it's not restricting, but it make, makes sure that it's contribute anything, you know, any marketing assets that you create keep contributing to the overall, you know, image of the company. Absolutely. And you, to tie it back to, you know, you mentioned the anthropology background and you could see they're getting into it a little bit with, understanding and research and all of that a lot of times founders marketers aren't the person or the persona that they market or sell to so it can be really difficult to understand them and i would argue even if you are that persona you're not you're still not the audience like you're one data point so how do you advise marketers founders ceos everyone's you work with to you know do the research and dive down and actually understand the customer like what steps do you take there Absolutely. The m- most important thing or the most the, mo- the most important thing that companies can do is to try and talk to their customers as much as possible. As in. Now, it, it can be really hard to do from within a company because when you have an existing relate, you know, an existing transactional relationship, people will be like, I don't want to give you my honest feedback or uh, they might feel awkward about coming into that conversation. Uh, but if you if you set it up the right way, it should go pretty smoothly. That said, try to understand like What's your feeling? What do you, you know, what was that experience like when you first converted? How is your experience now with the product or with the team? Trying to get that understanding. Again, saying how, not not necessarily who, what, where, when, and why. You can use that for context, but we try and understand how did that make you feel or what, you know, to use a what question though, what was going in your mind at the time or what did you feel? Kind of get an understand the context of what everything was happening in. And then you then you start to be able to see passions when you speak with multiple people, the things that keep coming out, it made me feel X, Y, you know, if it made me feel this emotion, you have 10 customers that said it all felt the same thing. Well, that's probably a pretty good indicator that you need to go in that direction. At the same time, if people can't, and again, it's, because it's also difficult, if, you can't, if it's a struggle to actually talk with the customers, anytime you have recorded demo calls or recorded sales calls, and you can go back and you can look at that, you can look at that using goal and using chorus or anything like that as well. Look back and evaluate what are the most common things that people say? What are the emotions that you need to describe? What kind of, how do they describe that? Which words do they use? And use that as clues to help you. It's it's a bit of an investigator. It's like a pri- being a private investigator for your own company, but you'll get to, to the root source in the end. I think the sales calls too is an interesting one because... I think sales should be involved in some way in the positioning, whether it's giving feedback, asking the right questions, like feeding them questions to dive down because, you know, CS is very close to the end customer as well. But a lot of the copy you're writing and a lot of what you're promoting is people who aren't yet customers, which is who sales talks right. to every day. So I always find, you know, it's a shame when they're left out and can't give their point of view because they will often have that ground level feedback that you're missing as, you know, the CEO way up here looking down on everything. Hmm. Exactly. Yeah, they are, again, and they're in that because at the end of the day, the marketing and sales have to work together in harmony. So to try and bring sales into the process as much as possible is is crucial. And I know April Dunford as well, you know, very, very high regard of positioning is because she does that. She says that's it. You get the sales team to test the messaging out. And that's that's the clearest indicator if you know you're going in the right direction. If people people's eyes light up, if their body language changes, you see them shifting their seeds, you see them they, like they suddenly get it. The conversion rates from those from those sales calls go up. It's that's when you know the messaging is in the right direction. You have to test it again as close to the customer as possible. Yeah, hundred percent. And it's great to do that, in my opinion, a little early, just to make sure you're actually on the right course. Otherwise, you can invest six months doing this. You have a whole website ready to roll, and then you 
put it by a couple prospects and it falls flat. So I think it's like this okay. iterative, ever-changing process. Absolutely. And then one thing I, I, one thing I do want to dive into, we've talked a lot about, I would say a bit higher level stuff like the strategic side. I do want to talk a little tactically about actually creating websites once you have all of this, because you mentioned the customer research, the positioning, the brand archetype, like it's all these puzzle pieces and all the parts put together. And then you have to compile it on a website yeah. where you don't know what pages people are going to go to necessarily, how long they're going to spend on them, when you need to repeat things. So what's your view on that? Like, how do you take those parts and then distribute them effectively? It's a good question. So usually the rule, my, my rule of thumb, and I know this, it, this is usually common from like many others practitioners in the industry, is that the that vision, mission, strategic narrative, that's that's a company facing pages. So if it's the our team or if it's our, you know, our company about us, why us, that's where that that can live. Like that's where it's supposed to live actually on the website. So people want to know, people want to know who they're working with. So that's where it should live. It shouldn't necessarily be the hero section on the homepage. Because again, often if you start with the car, if you start with the why, a lot of people don't really get won't get the why. They need to know about the product. And then understand how the com product fits into the perspective of the company as a whole. So first of all, usually again, it depends on how many products a company has or how many services the company has and you know how we need to distribute that information across for different target audiences and different use cases. But at the end of the day, the homepage, again, well, add to add one more point to that, it also depends on what your what your ultimate vision is for the homepage if you're you have a single product, you can write the homepage like a landing page. And I would say create it like a landing page. You, they Technically, someone could convert if they wanted to by the time they have all the, all the information they need. They don't necessarily need to go to blog resources anywhere else. But for a much more robust company that also has media, gallery, you know, all kinds of publications and things that they need to add in, so probably the homepage is going to be more like a, a crossroads. At a, so, you know, I have a sign like, take here to learn more about us. Click here to you know click click here to like click here to to view more use cases etc all these kinds of things so it acts as a as a focal point or a starting point for people who are coming to the site so they can find their way around easily like a choose your own adventure book that you should, so again usually that strategic narrative that's what the language is going to trickle the, the the there will be certain phrases so again there's certain phrases and words that will come out verbatim from the strategic narrative that will go. And help fill in the blanks on the homepage and across all the other pages at the same time. That the real page where that where that core messaging actually lives is on that kind of why or about us and company focused pages. Yeah, no, I think that's good feedback. And the thing that struck me as we were going through this is when to use repetition and when not to, because I I fell into this trap and you correct me and you were totally right, but Sometimes it seems like there's too much repetition, but the fact you don't know the path people are going to take and no. there's all the research on how many times you have to hear a message before it sinks in. So to me, that was a key kind of tactical takeaway is don't be afraid to repeat things on the website, like rephrase it. So it's not the same page over and over again, but it's okay to have that repetition. You know, I found that pretty useful and kind of eye opening actually when trying to write other pages. And exactly to your point, again, you don't know if. If you have, for example, your use case pages or different product pages, so you have multiple yeah. products or multiple offers, you have multiple pages. If you want to run traffic directly to those pages, which you should, <laughs> you're having you're running multiple campaigns, you're directing traffic to all these different different segmented pages and audiences, then you should treat each page treat it as if no one's going to go on any other page. So you really need to actually make that pay every single page really strong. So you can't assume that someone is going to open this page and open the other five tabs next to it and actually read them yeah. from top to bottom of them, they're not going to sit back and go, hey, that's the same thing. They're actually going to sit back and go, oh, they're consistent in their messaging. It's one of the yeah. wildest things. Like as marketers, we're so close to our messaging all day long. So we often think it's like we get often really <laughs> bored of it faster than our audience does. So we think we have to sometimes keep changing things up in order to make it interesting. But actually having consistency across different pages it's like this you know so they not only they know what to expect but expect but they understand that okay you've said exactly what the product is it's consistent across all these different pages like i understand what the product is and what it does or you said this is who you are like i understand that because it's repeated across all these pages what's that ultimate what's that value proposition great it's there on every 
single page, you know, and again, slight variation. So it's not, so Google's like, they're not going to think like, what's going on here? And, pay, you know, and penalize the site. But, but at the same time, enough to, it's actually really reassuring and actually helps build trust. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think one, one last point I want to get your thoughts on as well is, you know, we talk about positioning, which is really where you stand in the market, you know, where people should view you. And then it goes into, you know, so let me backtrack here, actually. So I'm looking for analytics software. So anyone listening is probably going to try to sell me it now if that's what they sell. But I'm looking at, you know, hockey stack, dream data, all the usual. And I find anytime it's something like that where I don't have a full understanding, it's really hard to figure out what the difference is and why mm -hmm. I should care when it's not in comparison to competitors or other options. But at the same time, those competitor pages are really hokey and no one believes them because, you know, it's the company promoting them. So right. how do you stand on that? Like, how can you position yourself against competitors with it being authentic and, you know, actually informative for the customer? It's, it's a really hard, it's always a really hard thing, thing to do. Because again, exactly to your point, it's like, it's like no one trusts the no one trusts the positive reviews on Amazon anymore because they know it's, yeah. everything's been paid for and they say, yeah, I filter like, by one star every time. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You want to see what went wrong and if it was taken care of, yeah. an issue was taken care of, rather than how many five star reviews that they have. Exactly. So to to that point, competitor pages are really really difficult. I think what's and, and again, no. It's very, very rare to find things that are at, that you're comparing apples to apples every time. And again, for people, if you're not a hundred, if you're not an expert in what you're looking at, it can be so confusing. You're like, wait, this is one thing in one place, this is one thing in another place. You're comparing the two, you have no idea what you're actually looking for or what stacks up. I think the best is to just is to be as clear as possible just about yourself. So, what is that value we are delivering, and to not stray from that. You can compare in general to other solutions. You can say there are other solutions that might be a software only, might be no touch, but we found people need support. So if, yeah. again, to, yeah. get, so to give a response with context. So you can always say, it's not saying, if you want to go no touch, you know, that's fine. We, there are no touch solutions out there. We are not no touch. Having, you know, having clear statements like that, it gives it with context. So it's not just an, you know, an X check mark, X check mark, like, you know, comparison, because again, you don't know who's going to be on the page and you don't know what the, what exactly they're looking for or what the criteria is. And you want to help them go in the right direction. At the end of the day, if you're not a good fit for a customer, it's like, why are you trying to force them to buy from you? They're not a good fit, you know? So it's, you know, you'd rather have a happy customer, happy customers at the end of the day, and you could have more good fit customers that are going to continue driving value for the business rather than trying to cast your net as wide as possible, capture everyone who kind of sort of might be a good fit, but will churn end up and a churn six months later anyway. So again, whenever you give, whenever you're trying to highlight differences, again, stick, stick with the value that you deliver. And if you're trying to compare something, talk in general terms and then give it with context. So again, a blow by blow feature comparison, it's it's so hard to do. It is. And I've made that mistake years ago. It's also a pain to update. Also, if you're incorrect, <laughs> their legal company will bug you about it. Like it's oh, just don't yeah, go that route. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just pull out the few. I like that. Pull out the few kind of key points of where you stand. And then that should make it a lot clearer to position. So, you know, we yeah. talked about a lot of positioning, messaging, copywriting, how it all fits together. I know this is something you do every single day and talk about on LinkedIn in various places. So if our listeners do want to learn more, connect with you, where should they go? Yeah, the best place would be LinkedIn. My I'm, my own website is under construction at the moment. It might be life of time if this goes live as well. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, LinkedIn is the best place to connect. Okay, so I'll include that there. Ed, Ed, Ed thanks so much. That was a lot of fun having a conversation. It's great. No, thank you so much for having me. It's been a, you know, it was a pleasure working with you. It was a pleasure, you know, joining you on the podcast today. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for joining me on this episode. My key takeaway was just that for so many years, marketers have looked at ways to have quick wins on their landing pages and websites. I mean, there's a whole industry called conversion rate optimization that spun out of this and it makes sense, but you do need volume to test those things. And at the heart of it, it is likely messaging and copy doing the majority of the work. It's harder to fix, for sure, harder to wrap your head around. But if you take the time to work on your messaging, instead of just testing which button color performs best, you'll probably have better results. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I'll be back next week with a new one.